And we're going to open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. All right, and in spite of all this time, as I'm sure you probably looked at the news once or twice, and you begin to wonder, what could you trust? I am thankful for our theme this year, which is, help me, I Believe God. I don't have to worry about, when I open up this book, what, what part to trust, right? The whole thing I can trust from cover to cover. If God said it, it is true. I get the choice to, to believe it, though. So I'm glad that our theme this year is I Believe God. We're back to Daniel and the lion's den. And we're going to look at the plot today. We looked at the players and the different people in the story. Now we're going to look at the plot. What happened inside of the story? I know it's a familiar account. I know that often in Sunday school, they will act out Daniel and the lion's den and at homes or maybe in your family devotions. But I believe there's some tremendous truths here for us in Daniel chapter 6. And if you would begin, please, in verse number 10 with me. So we'll look at God's word in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, beginning in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. I'm going to pause there real quick because I'm glad the story does not stop right there. March the 18th, we went into our houses. We're barely back out of them. Some states are more out than other states. I'll leave that alone. Daniel didn't have a shelter in place, a stay-at-home order. Daniel, when he knew the decree, the signing of the decree, he went to his house. And he did something there. I'm just glad, it's, I just want to tell you, I'm just glad that's not where the story stopped right there, though. Because <laughs> we'd be in a whole heap of trouble. But that's not, but the service just a free one this morning. He went to his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then those men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplications before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, and regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he had heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king, and said to the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the kings establish may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him in the den of lions. Now the king spake and said to Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his word, lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. The king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this time we have to look at your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us these next few moments. Lord, help us to have hearts that will listen to the truth from your word. Hearts to receive that truth, Lord, and hearts that will be willing to change an area, an attitude, a philosophy, a thought that would not line up with your word and with your grace and love. Lord, help me as I speak to say those things that would be helpful. And Lord, I pray that there's someone under the sound of my voice this morning who has never trusted you as their Savior, that today would be the day they trust you and settle that eternal home. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. It's hard in this particular account story because you know the ending, don't you? Preaching about this, this story about Daniel and the lion's den is kind of like watching a movie that you've seen before, reading a book where you jump to the end. You know how it's going to turn out. But if, if you would for a moment today, kind of take a step back, and we're going to look at some things in the plot of this story, in the plot of this account, some, some parts of this, of this story that I think um, bring some truth. If you notice, just something to point out in verse number 13, last Sunday night, Pastor Olette preached a tremendous message. All right, out of Daniel. He's in Daniel. I'm in Daniel. That's the place to be right now, I guess. If you're not in Daniel, I guess you're, I guess you're not anywhere you're supposed to be. All right, and you remember his big point was that God is, that God is our God, right? 
Well, you look here, and these men said, that Daniel, that Daniel. Now, that story was about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But no doubt Daniel had claimed that that God to be his God. And because of that, those men said, that Daniel, that guy, when you make Jehovah your God, you'll be that guy. You'll be that lady. Oh, that person, that co-worker, that one who, who man, won't say a crossword, who was always there on time, was so dependable. You want to be that guy, that lady, that Christian? Then make that God your God today. We look at this morning some things that were working behind the scenes. I'd like you to remember this morning that God is always working even when we don't see it. Now, during this whole a particular account, this whole plot of the story, we don't see God at work, but He's still working. All right, he's still working even though we don't see it. Daniel did not see God working till the end, but he's still working. And even when you don't see God working in your life, God is still at work. There are many things that work behind the scenes that we don't even worry about. How about your cell phone? How does that thing work? Well, of course, Pastor, you punch some numbers, hit send, and next thing you know, I'm talking to somebody in a different country. Sometimes Brother Rupal would call me when he was in Cambodia. I did my best to ignore it, but with caller ID, he knew I was ignoring his phone call, so eventually I had to answer it. Isn't that amazing, though, that with a few wireless signals, I can talk to somebody halfway across the world in a, in a completely different time zone? What a blessing, usually. How do cell phones work? We don't really know, but they're working behind the scenes. We don't question, we just use them and abuse them. How about a magic eraser? How does that thing work? I mean, this white hunk of foam almost, you, you touch anything and this thing takes off. I, I, uh, we had a van before and one day my wife had driven on one of those roads. They had just done the tar and the gravel that they do in Michigan sometimes. Doesn't fix anything, but I guess it makes people feel better. You've, you've driven down these roads? And it was just all over the side of the paint. I'd gone to a, to a, local, uh, a local store, a body place, and they said, well, try some gasoline on a rag. Boy, I scrubbed gasoline on a rag, didn't even touch it. I tried some WD-40, looked online, and somebody online said, you should use a magic eraser that will take the dry tar that had been there for about a year and a half off your car and leave the finish perfect. I thought, there's no way on God's green earth that this will work. Magic eraser is inside for your kitchen and for your dining room, not for your car. But I said, why not? I have nothing to lose. So I grabbed a magic eraser and began to scrub that van. And wouldn't you know it, the paint stain, the tar came right off. How did it work? Well, it's a magic eraser. (laughs) Working behind the scenes. God is better than your cell phone and way better than a magic eraser. Remember, we come to this point, remember we had a faithful man with an excellent spirit describing Daniel. We had 120 men who were jealous of Daniel's honor and favoritism and preference. We had a powerful king who was powerless. Today I want us to notice, well, first of all, I see in this plot, I see the reliability of Daniel. In any good story, in any good movie, you're going to have a character who just seems to always be faithful, steady Eddie. He is who he is, and, and this is Daniel. All right, he is reliable. You can count on him. I love that when the, Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open. The words to describe Daniel, he was reliable. He was faithful. He was obedient, all in connection to God. Some of you are reliable to your work, but not to your God. Some are faithful to your family, and you ought to be, and faithful to your marriage, and you ought to be, but you're not faithful to God. Daniel was reliable, faithful, and obedient all in connection to his God. This world will be changed if we have some Christians who are reliable, faithful, and obedient to God. Say, well, pastor, you don't know how I was raised, but God does. You don't know my background. You don't know my struggles, but God does. And no matter where you're at, Daniel, in a strange and foreign land for almost his entire life, we believe at this point, uh, they tell me that he was probably 80 years old. Most likely taken when he was maybe 10 to 12 years old. So 70 or so plus years in a strange country. Living with strange customs. Still serving God faithfully. Reliable and faithful and obedient. You see with with Daniel, there was no hesitation first of all. No hesitation. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when Daniel heard that. I can kind of picture, I think, what he would have done when he knew the writing was signed. I imagine he was a, well, he was, not imagine, he was a smart man. 
We know that from chapter number one. So I don't know if he knew or just uh, perceived what was going on. But when he knew it, when he verified this was signed, I wonder if he kind of set his jaw. He said, that's it internally, that's it. And took off toward his house. There was no deliberation in his mind, was there? Oh boy, what will I do? Who will I call? I'm going home. I'm going home to do the exact thing that I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> I'm going home, all right, to set this place on fire. There was no hesitation. There was just obedience. You see what Daniel was obeying is found in 1 Kings chapter number 8. Solomon is there talking, and he says, When thy people Israel, or, or God speaking to Solomon, is with Solomon there, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee. Later on in the chapter, If thy people go out to battle against your enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, and shalt pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen. Verse 48, And so return unto thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies which led them away captive, and to pray toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen. Daniel knew the Bible said, listen, if you're in a strange land, in captivity, pray back toward the city under the God of your fathers. And Daniel knew enough to obey. Our problem is not typically a knowing problem. Our problem is typically a, help me, a doing problem. It's not that we don't know what is right, it's we don't do what is right. Daniel knew what was right and did what was right. We need some Christians, some Christian young people, some teenagers to not only know what to do, but to do what they're supposed to do. Some Christian moms, some Christian workers, some Christian dads to do what is right. There was no hesitation in Daniel's, in Daniel's play here. There was no hiding. Not only no hesitation, there was no hiding. His windows being open. They were already open. They, apparently they were always open. That's how the men knew they could catch Daniel. But he didn't shut them. He didn't say, oh, I'm still going to pray. I'm just going to pray in my closet. I'm just going to pray while I, while I drive home. No, he went right to his windows, being open toward Jerusalem, and said, here I am. I'm still praying to my God. He didn't do the old, uh, he didn't do the old head bob for prayer at a meal so no one would see him. If he was at a meal, if Daniel had been in a restaurant, he would have got on the floor and prayed. He didn't do, uh, he, he didn't just, uh, he didn't just make a decision from his seat. If it was the end of the service, he would have been at the front laying prostrate on the altar. This is the Daniel with the windows open. Now listen, you can make a decision from your seat, I realize that. You can make it while you walk down the street. Here though, at, at our church, there's something about being willing to bend a knee and bend your heart to the Lord. We're still, Lord willing, hoping to have camp this summer, looking at a date there in the end of June, working with Brother Wilson, waiting for some state issues to, to work out. If we can have it, we'll have camp. And uh, we're, we'd like to have it. I believe in camp. But if we were going to camp, and we had a great camp, and not a single person came to the altar the entire week, if no one moved, would you say, wow, that's a powerful camp. Look at all those young people making decisions in their seats. Would you say that? I don't think you would. You'd say, well, why isn't anyone responding to, to God's word? Now, why would you say that about young people at camp? Yet we come to church and you're like, well, pastor, I'll make it right from my seat. Now, I think you can. And I'm not saying you need to be at the altar every single week. I'm just saying, if you've never been to the altar all week, would you say that's successful camp? Hmm. I don't think you would. I don't think you would. But Daniel, he, uh, he kept it. His window's wide open. He was, here it is, observable. He was observable. That's part of the reason we respond, because it's observable. A testimony to other people. Daniel could have prayed just as easily with, with his windows closed, but he did it. He said, listen, you can watch me. I'm going to pray to God, and you can see me. You can observe me praying to God. Is that such a bad thing to be observable as a Christian? Or maybe it's part of our Christianity. We can be known by our love, by our fruit, things that are observable. See, there was no hesitation, no hiding, and there was no halting. No halting. He kneeled upon his knees. There was an offering there. There was obedience, observable, and there was an offering. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, The test of a man's character is what it takes to stop him. 
Daniel wasn't stopped by the lion's den. What are you stopped by? Are you stopped by a co-worker? Are you stopped by someone who maybe will observe you? Uh, uh, are you stopped by your own embarrassment? Someone else said this character may be manifested in great moments, but it is made in the small ones. You see, Daniel was more concerned about his relationship than he was his safety, and he was more concerned about praying to his father than his freedom. Daniel was reliable. Late in his career, Joe DiMaggio, playing for the Yankees, and they were comfortably ahead in the pennant race. And someone asked, a reporter asked him why he continued to play so hard even though they were so far ahead. And Joe DiMaggio said, because there might be somebody out there who's never seen me play before. Maybe there's someone who's never seen a Christian before. When they see you, what will they see? Will liability, obedience, faithfulness? How about this? How about we just stick to God? Or Henry Ford. Henry and Mrs. Ford, Mr. and Mrs. Ford, celebrated their 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary. And a reporter asked them, to what do you contribute 50 years of successful married life? The formula, said Mr. Ford, is the same formula I use in making cars, just stick to one model. <laughs> Guess that's good advice for a marriage. This is not a marriage class right now, this is a sermon, but I, I thought it'd be good for Christians. You just stick to one model. The Lord, some trust in horses, chariots, whatever. We will trust in Jehovah. Just stick to one model, our God. All right, don't stick to Facebook and news or a lot of places to my bank account or stimulus package. We'll just stick to one model, and that's my God. Daniel, he was reliable. He was faithful, and God was doing something fantastic. November 18th, 1995, Isaac Perlman a violinist, came on stage to give a concert at Avery Fisher Hall in Lincoln Center in New York City. For Perlman, it's not a small achievement to go on stage for a concert. At a young age, he'd been stricken with polio and has braces on both legs and crutches to help him move on the stage. He walked across the stage painfully and slowly and at one small step at a time, eventually got to his chair and sat down and got ready to play. He bent down and picked up his violin, nodded to the orchestra conductor, who then promptly began the concert. Just as he finished, though, the first few bars of his song, something went terribly wrong. The sound of that Lincoln Center, New York City, there was a sharp twang, and Isaac Perlman had broken a string on his violin. Now the crowd, they said, kind of wondered what would happen next. He who had so much trouble to get there, would he slowly shuffle off and then come back on a bit later? That's not what he did. It says this, instead he waited a moment, he closed his eyes, and then he signaled to the conductor to begin again. The orchestra began and played right where they left off. And he began to play right where he left off. He played with such passion, such power, and such purity. They said the crowd had never heard such beautiful music before. Of course, anyone, even Miss Robinson, of course, would know best that any, it would be hard to play a symphony, hard to play a concerto on a violin with just three strings. Yet, Perlman refused to accept that. The audience could see him, they said, modulating, changing, and recomposing the piece in his head. And at one point, he appeared to detune the strings to get through a certain section. To get sounds from them they'd never heard before. When he finished that song, it says there was an awesome silence in the room. Then the people rose and cheered with applause from every corner of that room. They did everything they could to show how much they appreciated his amazing performance. Perlin smiled, wiped the sweat off his brow. And then in a small voice, reverent tone, he said, you know, sometimes it's in the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. See, Daniel was in a strange country, in a strange land with a strange religion, with strange people, in a strange situation, hard. He didn't hesitate. 
And the artist, God himself, is doing something amazing with what was left. The plot was going, and I see the reliability of Daniel, but I also see the reveling of the princes. Verse 11 uh, through verse number 13. These men went and they assembled to where Daniel was. Daniel, his faith, faithfulness, his, his reliability, his obedience, he went to pray. And they, first of all, they gathered in a certain place. They knew where to find Daniel. Like clockwork, the men showed up at his house. Now, how, do you, how did they know to show up at his house? They would probably observe him before, right? This was not the first time that they knew him to pray because in the chapter, they had amongst themselves said the only way we're going to trip him up is about his God, the only way. So they went back to where they knew Daniel was and they gathered there like clockwork. These nasty men showed up and they gloated. I can just picture, I can just picture, and I have a vivid imagination, I can just picture the expressions on their faces, the high fives, the handshakes, the hugs. We've got him now. This guy, he's toast. He's going to lion's den. We're done. We got the law signed the right way. The decree is locked in. Nothing the king can do. And Daniel, just like we knew Daniel would, went and prayed. Ha, 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 ha. Did they not know anything? Did they not? I know that they, they had just recently been conquered and, and some I'm sure had come in and some were still there. Had they not known of the fiery furnace? Had they not known of Nebuchadnezzar change to an animal? Had they not? Did they not know anything? These are supposed to be the smartest guys around. Oh, wow. Experts. Experts, they're called. Authority, they're recognized as. And right here in this story... They're fools. They're fools because a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. There's no God that Daniel's praying to. The God is the king, and we've got Daniel now. If they had happened to know about Jehovah, they wouldn't have been so uh, frivolous in their law. They gloated, and then they goaded the king. They went back to the king, and, and they goaded him. They, they had him a, a good setup question. They had the loaded question. Oh, king, didn't you sign a law according to the Medes and Persians that no one can pray to anybody but you, O wise king? Of course, Darius answered and said, yes, that's what I said. And then they dropped the hammer. Well, Daniel, Daniel has broken the law. You see, hungry lions do what hungry lions do. Faithful men act like faithful men act. And petty people connive like petty people connive. At this point, the story appears to be hopeless. We already know the king is powerless and Daniel is going to do what Daniel does. And now it looks like the villains are about to win. But I see something else in this account. In verse number 14, I see the realization of the king. I don't know if you wondered why the Lord put this in there, but the king, verse number 14, when he heard these words, was sore displeased. The Bible says with himself. That's very telling about this king. When you get tricked, who do you blame? I can't believe it. That guy snookered me. I'll get him back. Now we know at the end, Darius does take vengeance and get revenge for, for Daniel. From the Lord, vengeance is mine, I will repay. All right, the Lord. But here, Darius... It's interesting to me that, that it says he was sore displeased with himself. He realized that he had made a monumental mistake. Wow, it was, just, it was amazing that, that this man would actually acknowledge that he blew it. He realized his impotence. Everyone in authority is under authority. I don't care who you are or where you're at, you're not, you're not out from any authority. You may be the most powerful person in the world, but God is still more powerful than you are. Everyone in authority is under authority. If you don't believe that, just go driving down I-75 at 105 miles an hour. You will find a greater authority than that. We're all under authority. So quit trying to be different to break free. Be where God has called you to be and do what God has called you to do. Sometimes the young people, you teenagers... 
You don't like the authority. You want to get out. Here's how you know you're a real adult when you have to buy your own toilet paper. At that point, you will know you have now made it as an adult. You'll go to the toilet paper aisle and you're going to see a whole bunch of toilet paper. You never had to make that decision before now. Mom and Dad always picked it up for you. You'll see the Charmin. It's so soft and nice and beautiful. And then you'll see what you can afford. Sandpaper. <laughs> At that point, think of me and realize that now, Pastor, I'm now an adult. I've said this for a number of years to the teenagers, and I've actually had quite a few texts back. And Pastor, I'm not an adult. I just bought toilet paper, sometimes even with pictures. One time I had someone that they sent, they said the, the double ply, super soft. I think I text back, yes, we can probably only afford one package. <laughs> All right, so make it last. Everyone in authority is under authority. So quit fighting your boss. Start doing an excellent job as a Christian. All right, quit fighting what, where God has put you. Start living like you're supposed to live. Everyone in authority is under authority, and Darius was under authority. This law, though, was signed according to the Medes and the Persians. We actually find reference to this particular law, to these laws in Esther, the book of Esther. Artaxerxes, Artaxer, or uh, Hazarius, I'm sorry, Hazarius was of the Persian Empire. And he knew that law to be unchangeable. If you remember in the book of Esther, that Mordecai, all right, went to combat a law that was put into effect by Haman, right? And he sealed it with the king's signet. Well, the king could not change the law. He could just write another law. It was like a system of checks and balances. So when these men asked Darius to sign this law, they were trapping Darius so that Darius could not change anything. And now Darius, King Darius realized he was impotent as a king, even though he had conquered the ruling country at that time. He had conquered the known superpower. He was still powerless to stop one of his special people from going to the lion's den. He realized also his ineptitude and his inadequacy. The Bible says in verse 14 that he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored to the going down of the sun to deliver him. He worked the rest of the night to deliver Daniel. He said, I, I, can I make this happen? This is so important in the story, though. I believe part of the reason that God included this is to show that only problems, true problems, can only be solved by God Almighty. This king, who was now the ruler of the most powerful country, could do nothing. He was inadequate. And the answer today is the same as before. You can only turn to God. Nothing I can do can save me. Only Jesus can save me. I don't care what country you've conquered, how much money you're worth. You can't save even yourself, much less someone else. Only King Jesus can. God loves you so much. He sent us on Jesus to die for you, to die for me. He lived a perfect life on earth. Jesus did, born to Mary and Joseph. End of his life, he died on the cross to pay for sins. He is a propitiation, payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The only king who can save us is King Jesus. Darius tried all night, couldn't figure it out. There's some men, there's some women who try their whole life to save themselves. Living a life to try to get to heaven, doing as much good as they can, but it won't work, it won't be enough. Some clinging to religious and religious activities in religion going to a church their whole life thinking that will work their way to heaven but it's not enough only king jesus some just with their head in the sand maybe the problem will go away it won't only jesus can save you but you can believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved you see the plot is this daniel's reliable the princess reveled and there was a realization of the king, and it's the perfect spot for God to show up. How is God working in the story right now? First of all, God is letting everyone see the reality of the situation. They get to see Daniel as he is. They get to see these men as they are. The king gets to see himself as he is, powerless. Sometimes God works so that we get to see who we are and everybody else gets to see who we are. Now, God gets to show who he is. Now, God gets to show what's he, what he is in charge of. See, God's always working, even when we don't see it. 
This morning, you may be discouraged. You say, Pastor, I, I'm laid off my job. I don't know if I have a job when I go back. Pastor, I'm scared. I'm worried about this virus. I'm worried about my small business. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my home. I'm worried about my things. I got water everywhere. I don't know what situation you may be facing, but God is working. And right now, He may be working in the background. But just hold on a little bit longer for the end of the story. In 1898, James went to work for Guy Johnson and Thomas Callahan. They operated some small dry goods establishments called the Golden Rule Stores. Because of his tireless work ethic and his high ethical and moral standards, before long he was in a position of leadership, and a short while after that he bought out Johnson and Callahan and began to ran the stores. But in 1910, a few years later, he was dealt a crushing blow. His wife died. At a friend's suggestion, James turned, turned to philanthropy as a way to deal with the, with the grief and began to give a lot of his money away and show generosity. And six years later, in 1916, he met his second wife, but unfortunately in 1924, eight years later, she also passed away. James married a third time and poured his life into work. And by 1929, accumulated a net worth of $40 million. And then the Great Depression hit. Wiped out all his wealth. Devastated emotionally and physically, James entered a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. As he lay in the sanitarium bed one day, he heard a familiar hymn coming from the chapel. The hymn was an old gospel favorite entitled, God Will Take Care of You. Well, that's a great hymn. It's a greater truth. God will take care of you. The song, as he said, contained the message that he needed to hear. As he laid there at the low point of his life, he realized he didn't want to die like that. He was reminded that God would take care of him. The doctors didn't expect him to live, but James decided he wasn't ready to give up, and he cried out to God for help, and the Lord answered his request. His depression lifted, and he, soon he left the sanitarium. He didn't apply himself back to work, and once again built up a fortune. And James Cash Penny, better known as J.C. Penny's, J.C. Penny, further established a company we now know today as J.C. Penny. For decades, he gave away millions of dollars and shared his faith in God to anyone who would listen and died at the age of 95, trusting that God would take care of him. But on a side note, about 1940, shortly after he got out of the sanitarium, he was at one of his small stores in Des Moines, Iowa, and he trained a young employee named Sam in how to wrap packages. Sam, you probably better know as Sam Walton, who went on to found Walmart. Penny a Christian. Faithfulness to God. And God was working even when he couldn't see it. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your power. Why don't you help us to stay faithful to you? Lord, sometimes our flesh is weak. But sometimes the problems seem too large. But Lord, you're such a tremendous God. Lord, thank you. I wonder this morning, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if you need to be reminded of that truth today, that God is still working. You say, Pastor, would you pray for me that I'll stay faithful and reliable, obedient? Pastor, would you pray for me as you were speaking, God spoke to me, and boy, I maybe have been tempted to throw in the towel. Who would say, Pastor, pray for me? Let's slip your hand up, slip it down, I'll see it. I'd love to say a word for you. Amen. Amen. Who else? Pastor, would you pray for me? As you were speaking, God spoke to me. Lord, touch my heart this morning. In a moment, we'll stand and have a time of invitation. But I want if you're this morning or online and you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven. The only one who can save you is Jesus Christ. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, my friend, you can be sure today. The Bible says we're all sinners. 
but that Christ died for us. And if we trust in him and him alone, he'll save us from our sins. If you're here today, you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, or if you're listening to me online, you can pray and ask Jesus to save you today. You pray a simple prayer like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. And if you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, but you trust in Jesus, he'll save you today. Wouldn't you pray and ask him to? Pray right now, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you pray that and you mean that from your heart, the Bible says that God will save you. If whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you pray that just now and you're here this morning, just a moment, when we stand, would you mind maybe just slipping up and letting me know that? If you're online, would you send me a note? There'll be a number on your screen you'll see. You can call that or send an email or jump online to the website and drop me a message. I'd love to give you a free book today. So we stand to our feet now in the auditorium. Instruments are already playing. You do business with God. The altar's open now. Lord, bless this time of invitation. May we respond like we ought to. Lord, if someone's not saved, would you please help them to trust you today in Jesus' name? Many folks here to pray. Pray now. If you need someone to pray with you, we have workers up here. Love to talk to you. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, you'd like someone to show you from God's word how you can know for sure. We'd love to do that as well. If you prayed and trusted Christ as your Savior, would you let me know? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your goodness and your grace to us, Lord. I pray that you'd help those who responded to you, Lord, help them to walk with you and to trust you through this time, Lord. And those who trust you today, Lord, would they let us know so we can help them grow as a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen.